Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Before we get into our episode, we have a little bit of business, which is to announce a live show. Yeah, very exciting. Uh, We are going to be at the Eugene and Marilyn Glick Indiana History Center. Uh, We are working with the Indiana Historical Society to do a show for them on Friday, July 19th. It is going to be an evening show, and you can come for the show, or there is also a ticket option where you can come and do a meet and greet with us before the show and then go to the show. We are very excited. Yeah. I really, really love the Indiana Historical Society. We did a show with them before, and we had so much fun. So we hope to see you there. If you are interested, you can go to www.indianahistory.org slash events. And you want to do that because this is a show you need to register for beforehand. So again, that is indianahistory.org slash events. And we hope to see you there. So... In the first part of this two-parter about Vinnie Ream, we talked about Vinnie's early life, how she became a sculptor, and the way that her life just seemed to be constantly engulfed in drama after her family moved to Washington, D.C. When she was still a teenager, she lobbied for and got a commission from Congress to create a memorial statue of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, If you didn't listen to part one... You might be a little lost here, but more importantly, you missed out on a whole lot of juicy drama. So So um, much drama. (laughs) Go back for that. It'll also explain some context about how people perceived her. We are picking up her story today after she completed the model for the Lincoln statue and her next move to go to Europe to have it created in marble. The timing of Vinnie Reem's trip to Italy was somewhat good. She had been so raked over the coals in the press and in the idle gossip of Washington, D.C., that it was really starting to bother her. Although she was only 22, she had been made famous and infamous and had way more media coverage than even most celebrities were seeing in their whole lifetime. When her father traveled to Louisiana as she was wrapping up her Lincoln statue, He was startled to find that people there were gossiping about his daughter just as much as they had been back in Washington. Yeah, she was a daily source of article fodder for most papers. But before we get to talking about her time abroad, we also have to talk about why she had once again become central to a scandal. And to do that, we actually have to backtrack to yet another contentious scenario that played out in the months that Reem was finishing her Lincoln model because Vinnie Ream was at the center of the post-Lincoln power struggle in the United States. In part one of this episode, we read a quote from Vinnie Ream's Recollections, where she talked about listening to all the men, many of them politicians, talk while she worked. And she really heard it all. After Andrew Johnson became president in the wake of Lincoln's assassination, there were a lot of people who thought he was not strong enough in that role— Specifically, they thought Johnson was too soft on the Confederate states. In an interview in 1865, Johnson had stated, quote, there is no such thing as Reconstruction. These states have not gone out of the Union. Therefore, Reconstruction is unnecessary. I do not mean to treat them as inchoate states, but merely as existing under a temporary suspension of their government, provided always they elect loyal men. The doctrine of coercion to preserve a state in the Union has been vindicated by the people. It is the province of the executive to see that the will of the people is carried out in the rehabilitation of the rebellious states, once more under the authority as well as the protection of the Union. So a lot of people wanted the Confederate states to face serious consequences for the Civil War. But Johnson really seemed to believe he was following the path that Lincoln wanted, a peaceful resolution after the horrible toll of war. But in moving to allow Confederate states to once again hold elections and send representatives to Washington relatively quickly, he fueled a lot of problems. Many Southern states still reeling from the loss of the war tended to vote in representatives that upheld the same ideals that had fomented the friction that led to the Civil War. They still believed their cause was right. This is something we touched on in our December 2020 episode on the lost cause. So 
Then those congressmen brought back that tension to Congress. And this only led to ongoing problems like restrictive Jim Crow laws, which made it difficult to impossible for formerly enslaved people to actually start their lives of freedom in the states that had been part of the Confederacy. There is so much more to the events and conflicts of Johnson's presidency. That is really outside the scope of this episode, Here's how it relates to Vinnie Ream, though. Republican Representative Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania, who had been in favor of a complete reorganization of the southern states, initiated an impeachment effort against Johnson. As the vote on the articles of impeachment loomed, the tide against convicting the president and removing him from office started to turn. That was something that Stevens, who was very close to the end of his life, had been worried about. And the count was ultimately determined by a senator from Kansas named Edmund Ross. Edmund Ross lived as a boarder with the Ream family. So when Ross cast the vote that meant that Johnson would be acquitted, fingers immediately pointed to Vinnie Ream. She was a supporter of Johnson, and she was accused of having swayed the Kansas senator's opinion. This also came with the usual subtext that she was using her womanly wiles to do so. But this catalyzed a very difficult time for Reem. She was, as we said, nearing completion on her Lincoln model at this time, but her studio was abruptly taken from her under the auspices of needing the space as a guard room during all of these debates. But people really thought that they were just doing it to her as a form of retribution. She ended up having to move her work temporarily into a hallway until yet another debate and another vote gave her back her workspace. So it was on the heels of once again being portrayed as a manipulative interloper in U.S. politics that Reem finished the first phase of her commission of that statue of Abraham Lincoln and headed to Europe. It was almost certainly a welcome opportunity to get out of D.C. There's a side story about one of Reem's many admirers, a Confederate brigadier general, among other things, named Albert Pike, who was much older than Benny, Pike is a controversial figure in his own right, but it appears that he believed Vinny loved him. The two of them were close. He was given charge of her two pet doves when she left for Europe. But Vinny and her parents traveled to New York with Pike and Illinois Representative Samuel Marshall to meet the ship that was going to take the Ream party across the Atlantic. And Ream's decision to spend some amount of time in private with Marshall was greatly upsetting to Pike. A letter from Pike to Reem later said, quote, Marshall loves you but does not worship you as I do. Just one more parting scandal as she left the country. Incidentally, that relationship between Reem and Pike, like a lot of her interactions with men, is described very differently depending on the source that you look at, ranging from him being totally in love with her to being more of a grandfather figure. And this is part of why her story remains so hard to parse. It's been framed in different ways by different biographers. Based on letters that Pike wrote to Vinny, though, he was clearly in love with her and thought they were going to have a life together. He wrote to her constantly while she was abroad. Keep him in mind. He's going to come up a little bit later on. Uh, The Reams' route to Rome was not direct. After leaving New York on June 9th, 1869, they stopped first in Liverpool, and they spent some time in London. They next moved on to Paris by the end of the month. And there, Vinnie became close friends with General John Charles Fremont and his wife, Jessie Benton Fremont. Through them, she met Père Hyacinthe, the very famous preacher whose real name was Charles Jean-Marie Loisson, who had been excommunicated from the Catholic Church after he spoke out against the institution and made some incendiary speeches on the nature of religion. Vinny kept very busy in France, including taking lessons with French painter Léon Bonnat, and the luminaries that she met in Paris were just a taste of what was to come in Europe. She sculpted busts or medallions of many of these people, but she also did a lot of shopping in Paris, so much so that it kind of cut into her money reserves, enough that she considered altering her travel plans to omit some of the cities they were planning to stop in, although she did ultimately decide against making changes. Vinnie and her parents stayed in Paris until the autumn and then moved on to Munich, She was only in Munich for a week, but managed to meet and sculpt painter Friedrich Kalbach before heading on to her next destination, which was Florence. 
Honestly, this trip sounds amazing. After a couple of days in Tuscany, she moved on to her next destination, which was Rome. The goal was for her Lincoln model to be recreated in Carrara marble. Being in Rome meant, among other things, that she was exposed to other women artists from the U.S. who had taken studio space in Rome, including Edmonia Lewis, who we mentioned in episode one, Emma Strebens, Anne Whitney, and Harriet Hosmer. They have their own whole story. Vinny had varying opinions of these women. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. <laughs> Due to a mix-up, Vinny didn't have studio space waiting as she had expected. But once she did find studio space, she fully decorated it and called for her Lincoln model to be delivered there. She also displayed the busts she had made in Paris. And she kept the studio open as kind of a free-range salon to visitors. One of her frequent visitors was previous podcast subject Franz Liszt. At this point in his life, Liszt was living in a convent in Rome, and so the two of them were able to spend a lot of time together. Vinny described the two of them as having an innate understanding of one another from the start. Uh, Maybe they shared the odd burden of being so romantically appealing to a lot of people that their lives were often troubled by that. Um... I'd say also both of them surrounded by scandal. (laughs) Constantly. They had some parallels to their lives. Um, Yeah. She wrote a description of their first meeting that is really charming to me, and I'm going to read that in our behind the scenes on Friday. Okay. (laughs) Uh, We will talk about Vinny's time in Rome after we pause for a sponsor break. Vinny was in Rome for several months before an adequate piece of marble was found to recreate her Lincoln model. There was also paperwork involved in moving the model from Rome to Carrera. Uh, one of the biographies I read mentioned that this this legal happening ha- was something that the Vatican had instituted so people weren't carrying um, important religious relics out of the city without it all being documented. But, uh, and apparently it applied to her model, even though it was not that. Once this model was gone from her studio and had moved on to Carrera, she described feeling very lonely. She had also promised a lot of other commissions, which she worked on in the period where the model was out of her hands and being copied by artisans outside the city of Rome. She produced a lot of work during this time. It is often considered her most artistically fruitful period, And part of the reason for her business and the fact that she was working so hard was that she actually had to round up the money to hire and pay marble cutters. She had not received that second $5,000 payment from the government yet. And this was going to be a couple thousand dollars to, like, pay for the marble and get people to cut it. So she eventually brokered a loan with two American bankers who were in Rome at the time and offered after some haggling and after they all had a brief falling out (laughs) Out, uh, to co-sign a loan with an Italian bank for her. Once again, she met the most important people of the city and was even invited into the private apartments of Cardinal Antonelli in the Vatican to see his art collection. Antonelli spent a lot of time with Vinny and her parents while they were in Rome. One of the most famous non-photographic images of Reem was also created during this time. She was sculpted and painted by a lot of artists in her lifetime, but American portrait painter George Peter Alexander Healy was living in Rome at the time, and after the two of them became friends, he made a portrait of her. She's dressed as a woman from the Italian countryside and holding a guitar. We mentioned in part one that Reem had taught herself guitar at an early age, so while this costume and the portrait is really not her style, the guitar was an apt propped. That painting is now in the collection of the Smithsonian. Throughout her stay in Rome, Vinny often traveled to Carrera to oversee the progress on the Lincoln Marble. This was not a small trip. Today, getting to Carrera from Rome takes more than four hours by car. She had selected the marble works at the end of May 1870. That project was completed in September, so it only took a few months for it to be carved. After inspecting it, she had it sent to the port city of Livorno, which was called Leghorn by English speakers at the time, while she had to hasten an exit from Rome due to the city being overrun during the Franco-Prussian War. 
She and her parents went to Vienna until things had settled down, and then they returned to Rome to pack their things and their many acquisitions from their year and change living abroad and head home. Vinny did manage to fit in one last European romance with Georges Brandes, who would become a famous Danish critic, but after a little more than two weeks, the pair had to part. It was time to show Washington the statue. When the Lincoln statue got to Washington, D.C., it was placed in the Capitol Rotunda, but it remained covered under a tent. The feet of the statue were visible, and they were reported on. It was first inspected by the Secretary of the Interior, James Delano, who deemed it, quote, completed to my entire satisfaction. While write-ups and reviews based on the day of that inspection were already in the papers, the formal public unveiling took place on the evening of Wednesday, January 25th, 1871. As the statue was unveiled, a band played Hail to the Chief. Based on a lot of descriptions, this sounds like a triumphant night overall. The early reception was very positive, but over time, critics took a less enthusiastic view of the work. They called it things like dull and lifeless, but Vinny Ream had delivered the promised marble statue. Yeah, I think that's one of those beauty is in the eye of the beholder moments, as we know. Yeah. I mean, many of us have seen this statue. I think it's lovely. I couldn't make it. Um but simply by being back in the limelight, Vinnie Ream was once again the talk of seemingly every newspaper in the country, with wildly polarized write-ups about her. Her supporters were a bullion and praised her marble Lincoln as a perfect representation of the man in form and attitude. Because she had made good on her commission, her detractors couldn't claim that they were worried she was too young and inexperienced to be given such an opportunity. So instead, they just turned full sail into accusations that she had garnered her opportunity through sexual relations with older men, who in turn did her favors. And in the midst of all this post-unveiling press, Reem met Charles Francis Hall and Emile Bessels, who were preparing for the Polaris expedition to the North Pole, on which Hall would die. When we talked about this possible love triangle in our episode about Hall, the information related to him and ship's doctor Bessels made it sound like Bessels may have flown into a rage on the journey after learning that Hall and Reem might have had some kind of romance. But biographies of Reem characterize this love triangle somewhat differently. According to the biography Labor of Love, written by Glenn V. Sherwood and published in 1997, quote, During the summer of 1871, she received letters from Dr. Emil Bessels and the explorer C.F. Hall from Greenland. The men were leading an expedition to the North Pole. They hung a picture of the Lincoln statue in Hall's cabin aboard the Polaris. The men requested Vinny's autograph on two flags and promised to name an island after her. That really makes it seem like both of these men were friendly with her, but more like they were a group of acquaintances than having, like, a love triangle. A bit of additional light is shed by the 2004 biography Vinny Ream, an American Sculptor by Edward S. Cooper. In Cooper's account, Ream dined several times with Hall and Bessels together while they were all in New York. Not long after the unveiling of the Lincoln statue, Vinny had decided to leave Washington and set up a studio there. Per the Cooper biography, quote, Hall enjoyed Vinny's company, but Bessels became infatuated with her. There is also an excerpt of a letter that Bessels wrote her in that book that does indeed sound like a man infatuated. He mentions, quote, thinking of you all the time and anticipating the pleasure of seeing you. None of this really helps solve the mystery of Charles Francis Hall's death, but it does fill in some details. So we noted in our earlier episode the theory that Bessels was jealous of Hall's relationship with Reem and that that may have been what led him to murder. Still, no obvious evidence, especially when it's also not really clear how Vinnie Reem felt about either of these men. But the whole of their friendships are romances are just a blip in Reem's life. In each of these biographies, I'm talking like, a couple paragraphs. There's not much about this whole thing. She just didn't know them for long at all before they left for their expedition. As Vinny was trying to carve out a life for herself in New York, her brother turned up with a problem. During the Civil War, he had surrendered to Union troops and had been released several weeks later, and then he's alleged to have lived with the Choctaw tribe. Then he popped up again in 1872 after being arrested for larceny in Arkansas, 
and he was charged with selling alcohol to Native Americans. He was only found guilty on the second charge, but the sentence was six months of prison time and a $1,000 fine. He immediately went to his famous sister for help, hoping she could leverage some of her political contacts to get him out of this jam. She tried to get him a pardon, but was not able to. Uh, This was maybe some proof that her influence was already starting to lag. Her Washington heyday seemed to have peaked and fallen already, and she was 25. Yeah, so young to have lived all of the life we have already talked about. Right. But her brother Bob's arrest was not her only problem. She had a pretty real cash flow issue at this time. Her fame was such a mixed bag that it seemed to drive away as many possible patrons as it attracted. And in some cases, sales of the works that she had created, like her sculpture of Sappho, fell through. She made the decision to leave New York and move back to Washington in the hopes that she would have better luck there in a city where at least she knew a lot of people. And this did work out to some degree. She famously sculpted a bust of Custer in 1876, not long before his death in the area that would become Montana. In 1875, Vinnie Ream entered two competitions for monument commissions. The first was for a statue of Union Major General George Henry Thomas, She did not win, and the commission instead went to John Quincy Adams Ward, who had a well-established career in monument statuary. The second competition was for the commission from the U.S. government to memorialize Admiral David G. Farragut in bronze. There were a lot of prominent names in the mix to try to win this commission, including William Westmore Story and John Quincy Adams Ward. Reams won. This time, there had been a bit of lobbying again, but it had a more personal tone. Farragut's widow, Virginia Dorcas Loyal Farragut, was a fan of Vinnie's work and endorsed her as the best candidate and also helped get a lot of prominent and powerful people to do the same thing. When the busts of the competitors were all displayed together for judging, Vinnie fared better than her competitors and was granted this $20,000 commission. She conferred often with Mrs. Farragut as she worked on this likeness. The bronze that was used to cast Farragut was recycled. It had been one of the propellers for the Admiral's flagship, the USS Hartford. Coming up, we will meet the man who finally got the much-pursued Vinnie Ream to settle down. And we will dig into their relationship after we pause for one more sponsor break. As she was working on the Farragut Commission, Ree met Richard Leverage Hoxie through Farragut's son, who was named Loyal. And Loyal one day brought Hoxie, who was a first lieutenant in the Army Corps of Engineers, to visit while she was working. Hoxie was very handsome and he was very tall. Uh, his height was a sharp contrast to Vinny's very petite frame. We haven't talked about it, but she was a very tiny woman. She was uh, less than five feet tall, and most accounts say she never weighed more than about 90 pounds. She was very little. And Hoxie was, like so many other men, very taken with her. As Vinny and Richard started to spend a great deal of time together, tongues started wagging about a romance between the two. And this time, they were not wrong. But this caused a whole other problem, which was that Albert Pike, who we mentioned earlier, was nearing 70, was still in love with Vinny. And he started to write her some very jealous letters. When Richard proposed around the same time Vinny finished the Farragut statue, she accepted. The engagement was announced in April 1878, and they were married the following month on May 28th. General Sherman, and not Vinny's father, gave the bride away. And Richard did not choose his best man. Vinny did. It was Albert Pike, which, yes, seems like an odd choice. If you favor the narrative that his love for her was more paternal, that's maybe not as weird. But he literally wrote her letters about how he couldn't bear knowing another man had kissed her. So, Albert's daughter Lillian and Vinny's sister Mary were the bridesmaids. Yeah, this was a weird one to me. We'll talk about it on the behind the scenes. (laughs) I was like, um, okay. I, like, texted my best friend about it because I wanted to talk it through and be like, I'm not being irrational here. This is very odd. She's like, it is completely weird. <laughs> I was like, okay, great. Uh, after their very lavish wedding, Vinny and Richard went to Iowa for two weeks to honeymoon on his family's land there. 
And then back in Washington, the pair settled down into a home near Farragut Square. It was right by where her completed statue would eventually be installed. Vinny had once again campaigned to get what she wanted, which was a commission for her new husband that would keep him in Washington, D.C., instead of stationed somewhere else. He was made assistant commissioner in the Corps with an office in D.C. At this point, Vinny's art career was, uh, for a while, victim of the social standards of the time. Once she got married, she was expected to stay home and care for the household and her husband and not to have a career, This was something that Richard felt was the correct path. She did not need money. Richard was quite wealthy. He did not see any need for her to work. So after the Farragut statue was dedicated in 1881, she stopped sculpting, really, for decades. This wasn't something she just agreed to. She did pursue other commissions after Farragut, but they all kind of sputtered out. Meanwhile, her husband told her very frankly that her behavior often embarrassed him and he worried that her bad press would impede his career. Vinnie and Richard had a son, Richard Ream Hoxie, on June 6, 1883. The years that followed were very difficult for her. Many of the people that she had known in Washington had died. The circle of her influence shrank to almost nothingness. And then Richard was transferred first to Alabama, a move she dreaded and was deeply saddened by, and then to Pittsburgh, and eventually to Portland, Maine. And then her son was seriously injured at the age of six when another child shot him in the head with an air rifle. He had a pellet lodged in his skull, and though there was a slim chance that an operation could remove it, That operation would have been highly risky, and Vinny and Richard decided against the surgery, and their son was developmentally disabled. Then, Vinny had a bout of what she called heart trouble. This appears to have been a heart attack. She also had kidney issues. Her doctors diagnosed her with suppression of feeling. Wanting to work all of those years and not being able to had caused her a great deal of sadness and stress, and this seemed to manifest in a decline in her physical health. Richard was frightened by this incident and had part of their home converted into a studio and told her she could start working again. She did want to work, but she did not want to participate in any more competitions. It seems like she knew, like, one, she was too established to feel like she should have to do that. And two, that whole thing came with its own stress and all the lobbying that had to be done. So she came up with an interesting approach to finding new work. She found out which states did not have representation in the Capitol Statuary Hall. And then she started asking politicians from those states if they would like one. She first approached Iowa. This made sense because Richard's family was from there. And in 1907, she was given a contract to create a sculpture of Samuel Kirkwood, former governor of Iowa. She similarly reached out to Oklahoma about possibly creating a statue of Sequoia, who's credited with inventing the Cherokee alphabet. Reem had made a bust of Sequoia decades earlier and managed to get another contract with Oklahoma, this time to make a full-size statue starting in 1912. She was still working on this in the fall of 1914 when she collapsed while preparing to travel from Iowa to Washington. That happened in September, and Richard rushed her to Washington, D.C. for treatment. She had chronic nephritis and died on November 20th. She was 67. Vinnie Ream was buried in Arlington Cemetery under a bronze casting of her Sappho sculpture. Her Sequoia statue was finished by another artist, George J. Zolnay, and it was installed in Statuary Hall, where her sculpture of Kirkwood is also housed. Reem's Lincoln statue, the first full-size sculpture of him ever created, remains in the Capitol Building Rotunda to this day. Richard remarried, and his son with Vinny was placed in a sanatorium in the years after Vinny's death. Her husband also donated Vinny's papers and remaining works to various museums. Yes, that is how we have the um, that portrait of her that had been made when she was in Rome. Uh, Healy had sent it to her, and then Hoxie donated it to the Smithsonian, and that's how they have it. Um, basically, every way, almost everywhere I looked at, like stuff that had been, you know, her papers or whatever, it always said like donated by Richard Hoxie, <laughs> right? <laughs> no matter where it was, um, she lived so much life. I feel like if you are a fan of Vinnie Ream. We've left stuff out. There's no way not to. Mm -hmm. She was the busiest bee on the planet. 
and all up in everybody's business. So she just was part of a lot of stuff, but she was also a pretty impressive artist. Um, I personally do not understand all of the criticisms of her work. I think her work is lovely. So what do I know? Uh, But I do have listener mail. Okay. Um, This is from our listener, Rebecca, who writes, hello again. I'm behind again. So I just listened to the April 2023 episode on eponymous drinks. I'm close in age to you both, but I grew up in a very different part of the country, Hudson Valley, New York, uh, which city people think is upstate, but the rest of the state does not. So I always find it interesting when we have very different experiences of things. I do not remember my first Shirley Temple. By the time my childhood memories begin, it was already a well-established tradition that when we went out to eat at the fancy place, a sit-down Chinese Polynesian restaurant, my brother would get a brown cow and I would get a Shirley Temple. But where we went, it was always made with ginger ale. Until your podcast, I did not even know there was a lemon-lime soda version. When we made them at home, where we generally did not have grenadine, we would use the maraschino cherry liquid in place of the grenadine. I also apparently completely missed the Negroni Spagliato thing, having never heard of one before this podcast. Part of me is like, thank you, lucky stars. Um, Just because it got so contentious, maybe if you're on like bartender TikTok. Um, I am, however, a big fan of Negroni. I was surprised to hear the cocktail queen Holly is not a fan. Listen, I'm not the queen. I'm just a mere... Um, peasant in cocktail land, but I sure love them, Um, is not a fan, especially having heard her wax rhapsodic about bitters. I was only introduced to Campari relatively recently at a tasting five to six years ago and started looking up cocktails made with it and, of course, found the Negroni. I listened to the episode on my way to a spa retreat with my BFF, who first introduced me to your podcast about 10 years ago. So, of course, I had to get a Negroni. Their version is called Not Your Father's Negroni and replaced the regular gin with rose gin and added a sprinkle of rose petals. The rose was very forefront, then it mellowed to the spices of the Campari. Okay, this version I would probably have, and I think I'm going to try that. Um, By the way... My thought on the name Negroni is that it's possible that the drink was named after General Pascal Olivier de Negroni. As you point out, there is a timeline issue with him creating the drink, but it doesn't seem beyond possibility that a stronger version of an existing drink could be named after a military hero. But really, we'll probably never know. Uh, Hope all is well. Attached is a rare picture of my monsters cuddled together. Although Jack and Charlie have been together since they were six and 18 months old, respectively, they don't often snuggle with each other. They are 12 and 13 pounds of trouble and more trouble, but I love them anyway. I hope all is well and keep up the wonderful work. Okay, I love all of this. First of all, this is a great idea for a Negroni, actually. I love rose-flavored everything, especially in cocktails, so I'm 100% going to infuse some gin with roses and um, see if I can make something close to this. Second, these kitties are real cute. They look orange. It's a little bit dim in the picture, but they both look like, um, you know, creamsicle babies, which probably means that they are goofballs. And I hope they are mm-hmm. because I love an orange tabby. They are they are the nuttiest, cuddliest, goofiest cats usually. I love it. If you would like to write to us and share your thoughts on drinks or history or drink history and share your pictures of animals any animals will do we <laughs> we would love to hear them or read them i guess that address is history podcast at iheartradio.com you can also find us on social media as missed in history and if you listen to the podcast and haven't subscribed yet very easy to do in the iHeartRadio app or anywhere you listen to your favorite shows Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.